Well, a couple uh, weekends ago, we were over at my brother-in-law's house, and uh, just down the street, there was a guy who was doing like an estate sale, and uh, my son and his cousin ended up going down there and checking it out when I wasn't there. And as they uh, come back, my son and my nephew have a big arm full of boxes. And in those boxes, and I'm like, great, perfect, that's all we need. But in those boxes was a ton of old baseball cards. And I had told my son, my son uh, got into the Pokemon card thing for a little bit, and I kept trying to steer him into like a real hobby called baseball cards. Um, But I didn't fight it too hard, and I just kept telling him about it, and he thought they were dumb. But when he went and saw these cards for himself, he got like this crazy amount of baseball cards for like 20 bucks. And I I collected baseball cards when I was growing up, you know, and and my uncle, um, I went to my grandparents' house and found like old cards from like the 60s and 70s, these really expensive baseball cards. And there were dudes who collected these who were literally gonna use that for their retirement. And that baseball card industry went, It took a complete dump, um, and now some of them are starting to come back. But my son brings these cards, and um, they went back again to get some more. And it was this this old man who was doing an estate sale, and he was moving. And the joy from this guy's face that these young kids were into baseball cards. Like, you could literally see the excitement, uh, you know, in this old man, and just this pleasure that these young boys were, were taking a passion in his passion. And so they loved him so much that they went back the next day to go buy some more, and he had a garage full of them. The interesting thing is, and I started picking through these, and I'm like, there's some really good cards in there. I mean, we got like five Ken Griffey Jr. rookie cards, and um, I was getting a little nervous because when my son and my nephew went back, this, this man started telling them that there was these boys there yesterday looking at these cards, and he didn't recognize them at all. And my son didn't tell him either. And he went and bought more cards. And I got a little nervous, like, I hope this guy doesn't have dementia (laughs) and we're totally ruining this guy's life. Um, But he was so excited and so pleased that these young kids were interested in baseball cards. And so we've been picking through them together and it's just been this overjoyed experience for me too, that it's like reliving my past. And so I went through my old cards and one of the first cards I found was an O.J. Simpson rookie card. Not sure how I feel about that, but my son, like, I could tell him about baseball cards, but until he actually experienced it, until he could touch them, until I could help him look them up, um, he just didn't feel it until he felt the presence of those baseball cards. But my son, he also wanted me just to do it for him, and I sat, I've been sitting down with him night after night and walking through the process on how to look them up and what ones are worth what, and it's just been a fun experience for me, too. And I say that story because that truly is the Father's heart. I don't care how old you are in this room, you're a child to God, you're a kid, you're always a kid. He's called the Father. And so that is God's heart. As we journey together, as we journey in our life, the Father loves it when the lights come on. Like any good parent, when you see your kids understand something and get something, that's the Father's heart. He loves it as we journey with him when we finally get it. And that's what we've been looking at in this series. This is only a three-week series, but this is a a very important one. And we've been looking at this story that's a hinge story to the early church fathers. This is how they viewed the Christian faith, like how we translate the Bible and how we follow Jesus. And we've been walking through that, and this has been an incredibly important series for the culture of our church. And one of the main points I wanted to drive home is that this was a seven-mile journey that Jesus walked with them that they didn't recognize him. They didn't understand what he was saying. This is our journey. Every single one of us is at mile one, mile two, mile three, mile four, mile five, but there should be a level of grace that all of us have not arrived yet. None of us have arrived. And one of the issues in the Christian faith that I believe is sometimes when we give our life to Christ, we forget what it's like to be a new believer. And we forget how confusing that can be or how hard that can be. And and oftentimes, we don't show the same grace to people that we wish we were shown at the mile of our journey. And that's really what we're looking at in this passage is we've seen Jesus slowly walking these guys through it. And today, we're gonna see their eyes are opened. Their eyes are opened. But how? How did they get open? 
And Jesus was the first prophet to open blind eyes. That was one of his, his standing points. Like, there were miracles in the Old Testament, but there was no record of someone's eyes being opened. Well, Jesus opened blind eyes. He did it multiple times, and he did it in different ways. But just you, I, I say this to you guys all the time. Every physical thing you read in the Bible, there's a spiritual connection to it. So he wasn't just doing physical healings. There was a spiritual side to that. Someday I want to do a series where we go through all the miracles and show the physical side. But Jesus opened blind eyes. But he was there to open spiritual eyes. It was symbolic for this. And one of the problems, again, is one time he said the word and a guy's eyes opened. Another time he rubbed mud on a guy's eyes. And in the Christian faith, we always want to know, like, what's the secret? So what do we do? Do we go rub mud on people's eyes? Is that the secret? Or is that, the po that, is that not the point that Jesus was getting at? We see this scene where Jesus just steps on the scene. And he goes to the temple, and it says in Luke 4, he came to Nazareth, his hometown, where he had been brought up. And as, he was, as it was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. Now, that's no accident that that was handed to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. Notice these are all physical things. And recovery of sight to the blind. To set free those who are oppressed. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the people in the synagogue were intently directed at him. Now he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. A couple reasons why I bring this up and this is important. One, the Pharisees tried to stone and kill Jesus right after this moment because they recognized Jesus was telling them that they're blind. See, they all, the religious people thought they saw and everyone else needed to see. It sounds a lot like us today. All my, I mean, I'm right in everything that I see and believe and perceive. They're the ones who need to have their eyes opened. Isn't that not us? That's us. But Jesus does something here that's incredibly important. So week one, if you were here, I talked about Jesus being the word of God. Jesus is the editor of the Bible. The Bible submits to Jesus. Jesus doesn't submit to the Bible. Jesus translates the Bible for us. So if, you, if that doesn't make sense, go listen to week one. But Jesus is the word of God. Here's why this is important. When Jesus read Isaiah, he left something off when he was reading. Here's the actual verse in Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord of God is upon me because the Lord anointed me to bring good news to the humble or poor. It's a double word. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Why did Jesus leave that out? Jesus specifically left off the vengeance part for a reason. The word of God edited the word of God. And Jesus didn't come for vengeance. He came for salvation. He came for healing. And so that's incredibly important. Jesus left that off for a reason. But the main thing I show this is because these are physical things. Remember, it says release for prisoners. So from their view, the Jews thought the Messiah was going to come and release them from the bondage of Rome. But from a spiritual sense, he came to release us from the grips of sin and death. And so that's week one that I showed you guys. Jesus did edit the Bible. He took some things out and put some things in because he is the word of God. But the main point is he's here to open our spiritual eyes. One of the main shifts we have to do is we have to see with our spirit instead of our flesh. And it's a lifelong, lifelong journey of lining those things up. So I've mentioned this before, but I, about two or three times a week, if I can, I go to Mass. I go to St. Francis Xavier in the morning. Um, it's at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I'm always amazed how many people have shown up on a Wednesday to go to Mass. And I appreciate the discipline. And I go because it's quiet, and it's a great date. It's a great way to start your day. But there's a guy that sits in front of me. And he's blind. He's blind. Someone leads him into the church every morning. I don't know if it's wife or caretaker. I don't know. But I've sat there and watched him, and I just, I just got teary-eyed one day because this man can't see. But he does. He stands up. He sits down. 
He prays, he goes and takes communion, he says all the words. This man could have been bitter at God. And I'm here to tell you that man has better spiritual eyes than I do. That takes an incredible amount of love for God to be blind and go to church and listen and he is seen with his eyes, or his spiritual eyes, he's seen with his spirit. And I know a lot about the Bible. I probably know more about that guy but I believe that man has more faith than me because he's sitting there just believing on faith and that is what Jesus is trying to show us here. In this passage today, only Christ and his grace alone can open your eyes. Only his grace alone. And only Christ can open your friend, your relative, your co-worker's eyes as well. So one of the issues I see, and this is why I keep saying this, is so often we say, Lord, you just want someone's eyes to be opened. You can't open their eyes. You're not going to convince somebody. You know why? You couldn't open your eyes. You couldn't open your own eyes. So this should give us a level of grace for people. But we do play a role. We play a role as we see today. So as God is seeking us, we are seeking God. And that is how our eyes are opened. If if we just think that that we're just going to all of a sudden poof, It's not gonna happen. We do play a role in this, and we see these guys seeking God at the same time that he's seeking them. So, through this whole series, one thing I just want you to know, let's pray for open eyes. Let's pray for open eyes. I don't care if you're 85 years old in here. You have not arrived. You've not arrived. We need to continually repent and pray for open eyes, not just for other people, but for ourselves as well. So, Jesus has now broken down the Old Testament to them, the scriptures, and they still can't see it. And I'm gonna get at that in a little bit, but something's been brewing this whole journey. So remember, it's a seven-mile journey Jesus has been talking to them. Pick it up in verse 28. And they approached the village where they were going, and he gave the impression that he was going further. I mentioned that last week. It's like this great Jesus juke, right? Like, okay, bye, boys. You know, he kind of walks by. And so they strongly urged him, In Greek, it means they captured him, saying, stay with us, for it's getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. Notice, he met them on the road, but they had to ask him to stay. So we do play a role in this grace thing. Now, a lot of commentators have different views on this, that they asked him to stay because they wanted to know more, and they had a bunch of questions. That's probably true, but there's more culture to this as well. In Jewish tradition, it was a sin to not be hospitable. It was a sin to not welcome people into your home. And I gotta give the Muslims credit for this. In most Muslim nations, it's still a sin in Muslim nations. There's not many orphans in a lot of Muslim nations because it's actually illegal to have orphans. Like, you have to take them into your home. That's certain specific areas. But this, this comes from Judaism. The hospitality was a big deal. Not only that, that road to, uh, going further was filled with robbers, And so they were concerned for Jesus, but it was nighttime, so they were concerned that Jesus couldn't see. Hence the irony of this passage. They're afraid that Jesus isn't gonna be able to see in the dark, and they're the blind ones. And my point with that is so often, we try to tell Jesus what he should think. We try to tell Jesus what he should do, when in fact, we're the ones who should say, open our eyes, Open our eyes. So I I can just see kind of Jesus chuckling. Oh, you guys are concerned for my safety? Oh, you guys are concerned I'm not gonna find my way? And I love this, this, this humility of Jesus in this passage. But I think there's a bigger point here. For seven miles, he allowed them to chew on what they believe. Does Jesus seem like he's in a hurry in this passage? Does is Jesus forceful? Does Jesus stop and say to them, if you guys don't get this right, you're gonna burn in hell forever? What about us? When we have people in our life, don't we wanna force it? Don't you get this? Jesus doesn't seem that concerned. Jesus doesn't seem that worried. So first off, I'm gonna take a little pressure off you guys. You should have concern and love and, and for your, the, the welfare of your loved ones and their relationship with God. But sometimes we can get in the way of God. You cannot open someone's eyes. I don't care how good of a lecture you give them. I don't care how much in the Bible you point them out. You cannot open their eyes. And so I think we can learn from this. 
I think we can learn from this that sometimes you think people are lost and they're really not. Sometimes Jesus has them right where he wants them and I don't wanna get in the way of that. I wanna be the person who is encouraging them in their walk, even if I disagree with them. This is where the humility has to come in. You might think someone's lost. I might think someone's lost when I'm lost. I'm lost. And so the point of this is us journeying together but not forcing some of this stuff. So here's some things I've seen in Christianity, okay? I've done this. Here's some things I've done. Bless you. I'm telling you this because I love you. And then I destroy them. I've had that happen to me so many times. We're really concerned about you. We're, we're telling you this because we love you. And then they just destroy me and call me a heretic. And I'm like, oh, that's love? That's love? So here's my thing. Sometimes we can say this too, right? You know, so-and-so, we need to be praying for them because, blah, 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 blah. and then we slander them and we gossip them and we say stuff that we don't even know to be true. So let me say this. If, if you're really concerned about someone, make sure you do love them. Make sure it is out of love. And I've made that mistake. Because this is so important. We can get in the way of Jesus. Here's what we can do. Pray for them. Pray where I'm wrong and where I can meet them and pray that Jesus opens their eyes. That's the only thing we can do. So last week, I told you I was gonna share a story today, so here it is. One of the most, probably the most well-known patristic, which is early church fathers, that's what it means, writers, is a guy named John Bear. He is like a world-renowned writer about the early church. He's got his PhD, he's a genius. When he was a teenager, he went to his father and said, Dad, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in this God crap anymore. His father was a priest. What would I do if Easton said that to me? I'd try to talk him out of it. I'd be like, oh, oh my gosh, what, what are you doing? John Bear's father said, okay, be an atheist. I want you to go check out the 10 best known atheist books and I want you to read them this summer and we'll talk at the end of the summer. John Bear sat in his father's garage, smoked pot all summer and read atheist books. At the end of his summer, he said to his dad, I don't think I'm an atheist. John Bear is now the leading patristic writer in the world after his father allowed him to go on his journey. Maybe we can learn something from that, from Jesus and from that guy. He didn't say, let me walk one through 10 to try to convince you. He said, go ahead. And I think that's what Jesus is doing here. I believe what he's doing on this seven mile road, because remember, they said to Jesus, are you the only one who doesn't know what happened in Jerusalem? <laughs> Jesus was the only one who really did know what happened in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, tell me, what happened? I love that line, because he's not forceful, he's not trashing them. I believe what he's doing with them is what he does with us. He lets us go on this journey, exhaust everything we believe, everything we've done, everything we hold dear, so we can get to a spot to say, I need help. I need help. That's what he's doing. I love what my friend Peter says. He says, sometimes God lets you crash your own boat so you can meet grace. So these guys were telling Jesus what they thought. He's like, uh-huh. Oh, really? Oh. And they get to this spot where finally they don't know. All of us will get to a spot where there's no scientific answer. There's spots in the Bible that you just don't know. You're gonna get to a spot, we all get to a spot where we lose complete control. And that is when we meet grace. But you can do that anytime you want. You don't have to wreck your own boat. But all of us are on this road, and I think he lets us exhaust all our opinions to meet the truth. It goes on to say this in verse 30. And it came about when he had reclined at the table with them. Now again, I love this with Jesus, right? Is he sitting there like ready to give them a doctorate on why they should believe? He goes like this. And he broke it, or excuse me, and he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and began giving it to them. And then their eyes were opened. I'm gonna say that again. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. <laughs> what a letdown, right? There he is, poof. 
I have so many more questions. Why would he do that? I'm gonna break that down a little bit, but I, I think this is incredibly important. What Jesus did here, and he did this always, and we miss this, he became the head of that household. You didn't give out food unless you were the head of the household. And he did this often. So what he was saying is, whether, whether, wherever you're at in your journey, whatever you believe, whatever you're confused on, know this, I'm in charge. I'm in charge. But I love this again. He didn't explain the atonement to them. I love what N.T. Wright says when talking about the, I'm gonna butcher this quote, but he says, when talking about the atonement, he didn't give them a theory, he gave them a meal. He gave them a meal. And so often, I do this, I wanna to explain to you, don't you get this, don't you get this, don't you get this? And Jesus is like, I'm the head of the household and you cannot understand this until you receive it from me. We're always trying to give it to him. That's religion. They tried that with the sacrificial system. The point of grace is, I'm here to give it to you. Now that's a humbling moment. This is where humility comes in. You're right, I don't know these answers. I don't know what's going on. Please tell me, Jesus. Please tell me. So I love this scene because he is the head of the household. And so often when we go back, like I said before, us Christians, when we read him putting mud on someone's eyes, we're like, that's the ticket, that's the key. Let's get some mud up by the communion table. Come on up. And we try to box him in, and we try to make it this, and we try to make it that, and that's not the point. We always focus on the how he did the miracle instead of the why. How were their eyes opened? The presence. His presence. Only the presence of God can open our eyes. I love what Pope John Paul II said about the Eucharist. That is the presence. This is the sign of the presence of God. He says, receiving the Eucharist means entering into a profound communion with Jesus. Abide in me, and I in you. This relationship of profound and mutual abiding enables us to have a certain foretaste of heaven on earth. Is this not the greatest of human yearnings? So here's the thing, guys. It's interesting to me that he explained the scriptures to them and they still didn't see it. Still didn't see it. And this is my issue with what the church has done. We just hand people a Bible and say, good luck. This is gonna fix everything. And then we read it and we're like, oh my gosh. You know there's a story in the Bible where they literally, some woman took a tent peg and put it through someone's head and pounded it into the ground? What do you do with that? You're like, well, that's one of the first women's rights right there, right? So we think, we think, we just hands, because we've made the Bible an idol. We've made the Bible just this, here, just take it. These guys were Jews. They knew the Bible, and they still missed it. Why? Because they were taking their pre, uh, you know, their previews of God and putting it onto Jesus. Jesus said, no, I'm the translator of the Bible. So let me tell you this. It's scary, and it's hard, but it's a must. This is what I've been driving home for three years. You submit your beliefs, your Americanism, your Montanaism to Christ. We don't take the American view to Jesus. We take Jesus to our American view. And the bottom line is we've all been raised, if you're raised in America, we've all been raised with certain things. We have to submit to Christ. Is that scary? Yes. Yes. It is scary because we've gotten comfortable in certain things. But right here, these guys were Jews. They were going back to Judaism and he stopped them in their tracks. And what he was doing, he was just flipping them and he's saying, will you submit to my way? So that's the point of this whole thing. Our eyes will remain closed on certain issues until we say, Jesus, is this right? Jesus, open my eyes. And that's the journey. It's the presence. You're asking the presence of God to open your eyes. And the main thing he was doing is he was moving them from the right answers to an encounter, to an encounter. The Eucharist is a mystery. Some say it's the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. I, I don't know. The early church said that for sure. What I know is it's a mystery and it's commanded to do. It's commanded to do. What it does, I don't know. You know what that's called? Faith. That's called faith. So he's moving them from all the right answers to an actual encounter. 
And why he disappeared was to show them, when you take communion, I live inside of you and we are one. So I don't even need to be here. And that's the journey. That's the journey. It's like when I teach my son how to hit a baseball. I don't walk out there on the field and hold his bat anymore. He has to go do it himself. But I am with him. And Jesus is saying that too. I go with you. So did these guys get mad? Did they say, what? I have so many questions. Why did you disappear? Listen to their response. They said to one another, were our hearts not burning within us when he was speaking to us on the road while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 gathered together and those who were with them, saying, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them at the breaking of bread. So this is huge, okay? This should show you guys a little grace for yourselves. It says, while they were on the road. While they were on the road. See, we're always waiting for this moment. The moment is now. And when they looked back, they could see, man, God was there. That's when Jesus was speaking. Oh my gosh, we knew it. Isn't that our journey? Sometimes we don't feel it right in the moment. But then we look back and we're like, yes. That was it. But the point of looking back is to know he's working the same way right now in your life. He's speaking to us right now. See, this is one thing that I've been working on a lot in my own life because I got, I got so much room to grow. And it's just hearing the voice of God in that moment. I believe that God is not a God of confusion. And I keep telling you guys over and over that you hear from God. It's not just me who hears from God. You hear from God. You know when you hear from God, it's usually that first voice. But then what do we do? Well, that wasn't God, that was me. That was this, that was that. What if we stopped and just said, Lord, open my eyes. Lord, open my eyes. So he's not just working in the past, he's building our faith to know he's working right now. But it does take a conscious effort to just stop and be like, oh my gosh. But I also see, this is a huge moment. The Holy Spirit, when you feel these things in your heart, that's the Holy Spirit. This is a sign. This can be conviction. There's times I read things and I'm convicted. I'm like, that's not God. He's like, that was totally me. This is a sign. When you feel something, when you feel something reading the scriptures, when you feel something praying, when you feel something, that's the sign to take notice. Take pause. And that's what I'm working on is just to take pause. What is this? What is this? But it says his hearts were burning within us. That's the Holy Spirit's like flashing light to us. And so again, this is all on a different journey and there's moments where your eyes are open but when you look back, say, yes, God opened my eyes here and he's gonna open my eyes right now. And I love this verse because it's a finite verb and participle. When he says, our heart's burning within us, it doesn't mean that one-time thing. It means it was a progression, a progression of them moving forward. So let me just say this. Aren't you thrilled when your kids get it? Aren't you thrilled when you tell them something, tell them something, tell them something, and finally they get it? Aren't you thrilled when all that information leads to an actual experience with them? That's the Father's heart. On our journey, he's thrilled when we finally say, yes, we get it. Yesterday we went golfing, as I said, hurt my back. I didn't hurt my back golfing, this is super weird. I hurt my back bending over to get the golf ball. So, 40 year old, right there. But. Yesterday, as we're watching Tegan and Easton play golf, they were struggling at first. And now, I'll be honest, I suck at golf, but I love giving, giving advice about golf. But, so we said, we said to them, slow your swing down. You know, it's, it's just, he's used to baseball. It's just slow that swing down. So they started doing it, and they started hitting it better. And we were both overjoyed that they just listened to us for just a minute, and it went better. And what's funny is the next time up, I shanked one into the trees. But it's all good. It was great advice. Here's my point. It overjoys us when our kids get it and when they listen. It's the same way with Father. The difference is, Father, show me what to do. Show me what to do. Not, I got this, Dad. I got this. I don't need to slow my swing down. Well, have fun in the trees then, son. It's just slowing down. Listen to the Father. What these guys were really seeing was the Bible come alive. Remember, he explained the scriptures to them, but they didn't get it. But they were watching the Bible come alive because the mind of Christ was with them. Now, here's the deal. 
what really was going on, what was burning inside of them, and why do you do communion? When you take communion, you are ingesting it. It's becoming one with you on the inside. What he was doing, that heart burning within them, is the Christ living in them. And you've heard me say this for years. I'm gonna keep driving it home. The Christ lives in you. He's not out here. He's in here. And taking communion is a reminder of that. And so they are just getting it, that Christ lives in them. The Apostle Paul told us this. Listen to what Paul said in Colossians 1. I was made a minister of this church according to the commission from God granted to me for your beliefs, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is, listen to this, the mystery which had been hidden from past ages and generations. Now, just because something's hidden doesn't mean it's not there, okay? Just because it's hidden doesn't mean it's not there but now has been revealed to his saints to whom God willed to make known what the wealth of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles is. The mystery that is Christ in you. Christ in you. The hope of glory. So what's the message these guys would give? Hey, Christ lives in you. Christ lives in you. Christ lives in you. I don't know why my voice got so high there. We proclaim him admonishing every person and teaching every person with all wisdom so that we may present every person complete in Christ. So the apostle Paul was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew the Bible. Paul was a genius, not just in Judaism, but Roman philosophy, which is why God used him. He brought the Romans and the Jews together. But he missed Jesus. How did Paul miss his own Messiah? He didn't know the scriptures. He didn't know Christ lived in him. The apostle Paul killed Christians and he knew everything about the Old Testament. And then he meets Jesus on a road. He's going to kill more Christians. Jesus meets him. He knocks him off his donkey. He gets up. He blinds him. Why did he blind Paul for three days? Because Paul thought he could see but he was spiritually blind. And then a man goes to Paul and he, he prays over him and it says something like scales fell off Paul's eyes. Friends, that is our journey. When God opens our eyes, it's like this whole new thing. But what did Paul really see? The Christ lived in him and that is what opened his eyes. And so at the end of the day, it's not about going out there, it's about looking in here and asking Christ to illuminate your thoughts. The problem is, if you're like me, we often say, God, will you illuminate them? They're all kinds of screwed up. Instead of, Christ, will you illuminate me? And that's what's going on here. I love what one man writes. It pleased the Father, Paul recalls, to unveil his son in me. The fire now kindled in their hearts would become a mere encounter where the mystery that was hidden for ages and generations would burst forth within them. So I've, I wanted to take this last part of this sermon to just recap, because this is a super important sermon. This is what the early church used as an explanation on how to read the Bible and how Christ illuminates hearts and all that stuff. The early church firmly believed in not judging other people, but praying that God opened their eyes. Our job was to love them. That's our job. So week one, we looked at Jesus being the word of God. I'm gonna stand by this, it's just the truth. Jesus is the word of God. We must see all of life and all of scripture through the Jesus lens. The issue is, is we've taken the Old Testament things and brought them to Jesus. You take Jesus and take him to the Old Testament. Here's what John 1 says. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So here's the problem. Here's how most American Christians read this. In the beginning was the Bible, and the Bible, was with God, and the Bible was God. There was no Bible in the beginning. Jesus is the word of God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, not even one thing came into being. Do you think he's trying to relay something here? Has came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and life was the light of mankind, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not grasp it. Before the Bible, before our deluded minds about God, Jesus is the word, he is the logos. He is the head of the universe. He is the head of your household. Whether you believe it or not, he is the head of your household, and we follow the perfect one. So here's the thing. Week one, this is important. We do not follow Joe Biden. We do not follow Donald Trump. 
We do not follow Republicans. We do not follow America. We do not follow Moses. Even Moses said, there's one coming after me greater than I. Listen to him. We do not follow anyone. You do not follow any preacher because we're flawed. You do not follow me. You do not follow anyone. You follow Jesus Christ. He is the word. That would change everything. We follow Jesus Christ. And again, that's hard because you have to submit your worldview to Christ. But that's how your eyes are open. In week one, I said, I'm gonna say it again. We are called to be Christ-like, not just biblical. There's a lot of things in the Bible that aren't Christ-like. We are called to be Christ-like first. And that's the tension. There is a tension when you read the scriptures. There's supposed to be. That's how you grow. When you go to the gym, do you stand there and just stare at the dumbbells? Some of you are like, Okay, well, let me enlighten you. Let me open your eyes. You're doing it wrong, okay? You gotta pick them up. You gotta do something. So that's the tension. Tension builds muscles. It hurts, but it builds. That's supposed to, so don't get worried when there's a tension. You know what? Get worried when there's not a tension because then you think you've arrived, okay? So that's important. He's the word of God and we are called to be Christ-like. One man writes this, and this might shock some of you, but it's true. The Bible isn't a book about how to get into heaven, it's rarely talked about. It's a library of poems and letters and stories about bringing heaven to earth now. About this world becoming more and more the place it should be. This is very, there is very, very little in the Bible about what happens when you die. That's not what the writers were focused on. Their interest again and again is how this world is arranged. Does everyone have enough? Are the power structures tilted in favor of the vulnerable? Has violence been renounced or is it being kept in circulation? He's right. We have made the Christian faith fire insurance. I just don't want to go to hell. That's it? I know that's a big deal, but I've listened to sermon, and it works. It works because you can gauge it. You said the prayer, you're good. That is not what this is. We are here for all eternity growing in Christ's likeness. So here's my belief. I don't know if this is true, but here's what I believe. I believe for all eternity, we're gonna be discovering more. I believe for all eternity, we're gonna be growing more like Christ. I believe for all eternity, it's gonna be an adventure. Those pictures of us sitting on a cloud with a harp and a diaper, what? <laughs> that's just weird, right? That's super weird. If that's heaven, I'm not sure I wanna go there because it's weird. So we've made this. Ah, I said the prayer, that's it. And then we can do whatever we want. That's not true. I believe it's a lifetime of discovery. I'm hoping, book of Scott, verse two, that I can ask God someday and be like, yo, can I go make some planets? What if I made them after my image? And he's like, no, no, we're not doing that, right? I believe for all eternity, it's discovery. So let's start now. It's more than just fire insurance. It's opening up to that now. Christ lives in you. If you don't believe it, it doesn't matter. Christ lives in you. You participate by saying, I believe, now open my eyes and open my mind. That's all you do, and it's a lifelong journey. So that's week one. Week two, we saw these guys thinking they're going back to religion. They left the faith. They were going back to Judaism. Really, they were leaving religion because Jesus met them on the road outside the temple. That's important. Jesus walked with them for a seven-mile journey. All of us are on a different mile. Let's show each other grace. Some of you think you're in mile five, and I've had this. I think I'm on mile five, and I do something stupid, and God's like, you're kind of on mile two, man. You were on mile one once, okay? Show grace to people who are on mile one. And let's not get haughty and think we're in mile six. It's a lifetime of growth. Are we open to new? Are you open to new discovery? Are you open for Christ to open your mind? See, here's the thing, I'm gonna, this might shock you. Do you know that truth isn't a Christian thing? Did you know that truth is just truth? Jesus never said, I give you Christian truth. He says, I give you the truth. So there's truth in Buddhism. There really is, because I think everyone's leading to God. Do I think Buddhism is the truth? No, because you're, you're your own savior in Buddhism. But there is certain truths in Buddhism. Truth is truth. Can we be open to that and bridge the gap? 
Father Jarmus, who was here a few weeks ago, he's not the hugest fan of St. Augustine. Either am I, by the way. I, I love City of God. But Augustine has a, a major player in how we got here with our theology. But his last 15 years were a little rough. However, Father Jarmus always quotes Augustine. And I asked him, you don't even really like Augustine that much. Why do you quote him? He said, truth is truth. I respect that. I respect someone to say, you know what, I don't agree with some of that, but that's truth right there. And I hope someone shows me that same grace, because I haven't arrived. So here's the thing, if we're gonna have Christ open our eyes, let's admit, we need him to open our eyes. Truth is truth. Let's open his, let's have him give us ultimate truth as we humbly submit to him. The bottom line in week two is that everyone is walking on this journey. And all I know, all I know, is he's the author and finisher of our faith. I'm not the finisher of your faith. Jesus Christ is the finisher of your faith. And finally today, this is incredibly important. It says their hearts burned within them. We can see where he worked in the past and we can see where he's working now. However, it wasn't the Bible that opened their eyes. It was the presence of God in the Eucharist. This is one thing we're commanded to do. We're commanded to get baptized and we're commanded to take the Eucharist. And it's a mystery. As I said before, I don't know how this works. But what I do know is we haven't taken it serious enough and this is faith. And so let me just challenge you on this. There's times when after I walk off stage, I go into my office and I see people leaving church before you take the Eucharist. I tell myself that your house is on fire and then I pray for you that you're okay. This means we have no concept of the Eucharist. And I've repented for how I've taken it not, as, not serious enough. So I don't know if you know who Francis Chan is. Francis Chan is a famous evangelical author. And he's been on a journey for 10 years. He started shifting some of his views and he basically got kicked out of reformed theology. He's a heretic now to them. But he's just growing, he's just changing. And he just came out with a video saying, we have not taken the communion table serious enough. In most evangelical churches, they take it once a month. Some, once a quarter. And we've made that shift at Zootown. We've always taken it every week. Because this is important. And Francis Chan had this great line. He says, he had a dream that the church was a banquet hall, not a lecture hall. I'm gonna say that again. That the church is a banquet hall, not a lecture hall. And we've made church into a lecture hall. The church is not supposed to be a place, a prison, where we condemn sinners. It's supposed to be a hospital where we offer life. And that's the culture of Zootown Church. And so I can tell you this, I stand up here and I give you guys lectures. I give you guys lectures. It might change you in the moment, but it's not gonna change you in the long haul. This is what changes you. So take this seriously. And so let me just say this, don't leave the table. Don't take this lightly. This is where faith meets. It's a mystery, it's a mystery. I don't know what it does, but it's a lifetime of growing and growing and growing. Do not leave the table. If you have questions, bring them to the table. If you have doubts, bring them to the table. If you're struggling with sin, join the club. Bring them to the table, okay? You know why it's amazing? You know why we started lining up here? Because then we're all in line as equal sinners. We're equal sinners. And we're all offered this, but our eyes, you might be the biggest hater on Christianity, you might have tons of questions, I'm sorry, you will not understand it until you submit to the communion table. This is important. What it does, I don't know. But our eyes aren't opened until we receive from God, not give to God, receive from God. So don't leave the table. Again, if you leave, I'm just gonna tell myself, your house is on fire. But you're, you're missing this. You're not getting this. If you're coming just to get information, it's not gonna last. Can you honestly remember what I said last week at church for 45 minutes? I've told you this before. You're all at different levels. Some of you are here for 10 minutes, meaning you're in my sermon for 10 minutes. Some of you are already gone. And I trust that Jesus wanted you to hear that 10 minutes. But my words are not going to fix you. They're not because they won't fix me. This is what Jesus commanded us. 
this is where Jesus told us to put our faith and our trust. And he's like, you won't see it. These guys didn't see it, but just believe it and just have faith. That is faith. And we've made Christianity just about knowing stuff and knowing facts. And it's not helping and it's not fixing anything. We need the presence of God. Band, you can come on up. While, while this scene is going on, the other disciples are hiding in a house. <laughs> and we're not told they were taking communion. But these two guys went back and said, We've, we saw the Lord when we took communion. And you know what happened after this moment? The 12 disciples go fishing, and Jesus meets them on a shore, and what does he do? He feeds them again. And so we've made Christianity so hard. And it's, it's, it is tough being a Christian. It's tough submitting to Christ's will. But it's very simple what to do about it. You repent and you take communion. You repent and you take communion. And you admit that you haven't arrived and you pray God opens your eyes. The only way to have your eyes opened is to feel the presence of Jesus Christ. And I love Job because Job, if Job gets, the book of Job gets so misused. You gotta get to the end of Job to understand the point. There's a lot of bad advice in Job, by the way. But Job lost his whole family, thought God hated him. And he had all his friends telling him he did something wrong. You ever been there where, where things aren't lining up in your life and some Christian comes to you and says, well, what have you done? It's your fault. And we get to the end of this and listen to what Job comes to the conclusion is. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no plan is impossible for you. This is such a great prayer. Who is this who conceals advice without knowledge? Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I do not know. Please listen and I will speak. I will ask you and you instruct me. Not instruct God, you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Notice, he just heard of God. Some of you have just heard of God. But now my eyes see you. Therefore, I retract and I repent, sitting on dust and ashes. Job was like, man, I've heard of you. I've probably told people about you, but now I see you and now I feel you, and that's what we're longing for. That's what we're asking. Let me feel the presence. Sometimes that presence is conviction. Embrace it. Embrace it. Because it's not a mean dad. It's a dad bringing you forward in your journey. And so I just, I just want to share a quick story, just real quick. But, and I, I, this happened months ago, and I haven't shared it because it was so precious. My son has an eating disorder. His tonsils grew together when he was two and they, like he couldn't eat and it caused an eating disorder in him. And that poor kid, like we thought when he went to school, he'd see all his friends eat and be jealous and he's like, I don't care what they're eating. <laughs> he eats about three, he ate about three foods. And you know, we, I, I've said so many stupid things to him to try to coerce him. And it just comes down to shame. And, and honestly, it's always more about us, right? I'm tired of you packing your peanut butter and jelly sandwiches around everywhere. You know, it's so stupid. Because he's the one hurting. A couple months ago, I made him a burrito. And my my wife was at work, and I wish she was there. I don't know why it happened and she wasn't there, but my daughter and my son and I were all sitting on this bench, and like he, he, he had a panic attack over a burrito. And it's not his fault. It's not his fault. And Lily and I were trying to coerce him and talk him into eating this burrito. I know this sounds stupid, but it's been a big deal for 10 years at our house. Because then you second guess yourself, like, what did I do? Did I do something? I'm sorry, God, I repent. Was it me? I'm sorry. And we were sitting there, and I'm not kidding. I don't know how to explain this, but this, the Holy Spirit entered our house. Like, you could, you could feel it, like, coming into the, the hall and then into the, the kitchen. And we were all shaking, and my kids, my kids just started crying. My kids just started weeping. 
and we were, but we were happy. <laughs> we were happy. And you know, I know there's been a lot of weird charismatic stuff out there that tries to force the Holy Spirit. And some of it's a show, some of it's real. I'm not here to judge them, but this was real. This was real. And I stopped my kids and I said, do you feel it? Like, do you feel this? And they're like, yes, yes, we feel it. And I was like, this is the Holy Spirit. And it's like, we would have never known that if we felt it all the time, <laughs> right? And I'm like, this is the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. This is what it's like. This is what it's like. Because I've had those moments in my life and I wish they happened more. I wish they do. But they don't. They don't. And we just prayed over my son and we prayed over my daughter and they prayed over me. And it was like my, my kids were saying things about God. It was incredible. It was so thick. You could taste it. And it wasn't the burrito. <laughs> And my son ate that burrito. And it's not like that was the end. I mean, there's still been some things, but he's eating more foods and we're introducing more foods. And it was like this moment, this moment. And then it was gone. It was gone. And the reason I haven't shared it is because it, it felt like holy ground. It felt like I was on holy ground. And I can explain that to you and you can't feel it, right? I explained it to my wife and she couldn't feel it. And she's had moments like that too. And it's not her fault. I don't know why it happened. I'm like, why wasn't she here? You know? But I go back to that verse where Jesus said, the spirit's like the wind. You do not see it. You do not where it's going. But you feel it, right? You can feel the wind. And I want more of that. I want more of that. I want more of that. And I can just tell you, after 14 years of being a pastor and reading Greek and Hebrew and all that, this is all I got. This is all I got. And I'll be honest, this is all I want. I've had stuff, I've had money, I've had all that stuff, and I just fail and I fail and I fail. I just want this. I want this. And so I say that because the scriptures, they can open your eyes, but it's the presence. Even Jesus is opening your eyes when you read the scriptures. But this matters. This matters. So don't leave the table. Don't leave the table. I'm watching Christian after Christian walk away and then they just become cynics. As Father Jarma says, you become what you hate. <laughs> and so this is what we have to offer at Zootown. And I'm gonna give lectures and I'm gonna give sermons, but at the end of the day, this is it. This is it. And we're all equal sinners in this place. We're all equal sinners. But when you take this, you're allowing Christ to feed you. And then you trust Christ. So today, let's repent. Repent means change the way you think and act. Change and align your thoughts up with God. So do this in remembrance of him. And trust, you keep doing it, you keep doing it, you keep doing it. And it's, it's doing something, it's doing something. But all my words don't matter. It's leading you to this. So do this in remembrance of him. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.